Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Philosophy of Data Science series. Today, we are going to be doing our episode on critical reasoning for medical machine learning. And if, for those of you who want to hop just to the presentation, I'm including the timestamp in the corner right here. But before we do, I would like to introduce our guest host for today, Kristen Morgan from the University of Connecticut. Uh, Kristen, maybe you could introduce yourself further and your own research. Hi, right, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me on today. Uh, my name is Kristen Morgan. I'm an assistant professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Connecticut. Um, and my work really focuses on, on applying statistics and engineering techniques to understanding, describing, quantifying human movement. Um, and so really the big goals of that work are either to use it for injury prediction or to optimizing rehabilitation strategies. Cool. And so the question is, why are you here today? <laughs> I'm here to help you out. Um, he I'm is. here to learn more, more about your work. Um, and like you said, what are you, you're talking about clinical reasoning and, and machine learning. And one of the things I thought, you know, I know our, we, our worlds are slightly different, but I was thinking about it for today. And I realized that, you know, our work, both of us are using physiological signals to evaluate human health. So uh, I think that's the link for here, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what you're, you're doing. Yeah, that, that is really helpful. And uh, Kristen is being modest. She's also just being really helpful because it is so lonely just talking to a screen when you record these things. So as you guys know from episode zero, it's a little bit you know sad and lonely. So this is really helpful. Kristen's me here. She's going to liven up the conversation. And um, uh, I did uh, choose Kristen specifically for this because as she mentioned, there are a lot of uh, crossovers between her work and mine. She understands all the frustrations. Um, she also is, of course, uh, very knowledgeable about statistics and biomedical engineering. Um, so we share that same background. And um, also how there are certain hard physiological realities of the phenomena that both uh, Kristen and I model that can't be negotiated with. You know, there, there's no fancy amount of machine learning that is going to make a person's, you know, leg in Kristen's case, you know, move at an angle that it's not meant to move at. And if it does, you have a real problem. And similarly for me, there's certain physiological and clinical realities of the stuff that I work on that you can't negotiate with. You have to deal with those. And that's part of the creative process of the machine learning. Um, and for those who are interested in more of Kristen's work, a uh, very cool thing coming up that Kristen's lab will actually be our first lab spotlight on the uh, Pod of Asclepius, the main uh, podcast series. So I thought it'd be very good to start doing these more holistic representations of the research that's being done in uh, medical data science. And one of the things I think is interesting is covering a research group in its whole. So Kristen will be coming on and being our headliner for that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks again. We're excited. Yeah, cool. So I guess we will now go on to the presentation. All right, so today's presentation is on critical reasoning in medical machine learning. And one of the, very commonly when people talk about applied machine learning, the presentations tend to revolve around their success stories. Either explicitly stating a success story of applying machine learning to a clinical problem, or it's implicit in some, in, for example, the methods that they develop, that there's an implicit success story that now we have these new capabilities. And an example is, for example, could be my own work where I say, you know, I work in vital sign patient monitoring. So for anyone who has seen the medical dramas on television, they have these uh, screens that show a patient's vital signs like heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2. And what I say is something like this. Uh, what a clinician, a doctor currently sees is the patient at a given point in time. So they see the patient's vital signs at a current snapshot in time. But because they aren't computers, um, what they miss out on is that rich tapestry of time series information that's left behind. So there's a lot, there's a rich time series that is only culminating in a single snapshot that they're seeing. And so when presenting my success story, it might be something like this. Well, using Gaussian process modeling uh, or time series modeling, what I do is something like I can fit my model to a patient's individual vital sign time series. And then I can deliver a cool clinical inference like the following. This Gaussian process has fit itself to a patient's current heart rate data and forecasted for it. And what it's identified is that there's this large drop in the patient's heart rate, which was not forecasted. And so while a clinician might say, ah, well, the patient was currently, was previously at 140 beats per minute, 
and now they have dropped down to 120 beats per minute. The patient must be getting better because uh, 140 is much more abnormal than 120. In contrast, what the machine learning method is suggesting is that no, this drop is too precipitous given what we know about the patient's noise regime and, and trends. And so the machine learning method might say this drop is too precipitous. It's actually something that ought to be investigated. So we should figure out why they drop this rapidly. And so that might be an added piece of clinical value that the machine learning method is adding to the clinician's arsenal. Another thing that we might say is the following, another success story. Well, if I fit my time series to the data, I can then throw out the data and just keep the fit of this new patient. And then I can compare that new patient's fit to this dictionary of clinically annotated healthy patients and say, does this new patient look like a healthy patient or not? And if the patient doesn't look like a healthy patient, does that mean that they're deteriorating? So again, instead of looking at an individual point in time, I'm now comparing the patient's entire time series to a reference dictionary of healthy patients. And we now have access to essentially more empirical, more robust, more principled ways to make these types of clinical inferences. And so yeah, for your work, I'm wondering how do you guys go about collecting all this data or, or how do you get, um, you know, I'm wondering if the heterogeneity of your data, is it divided by race, gender, these kind of things? What, it, what is kind of the makeup of your data sets typically? Yeah, that, that is a good question because obviously it's, first of all, it's one of those things that we, uh, that does both need to be collected for the actual clinical scenario at hand, but of course should not always be available to people like you and I who are simply, you can consider more casual analysts of the data. So as you know, uh, we certainly do want to understand the demographic background of the person because those do have implications about what their vital signs might be. The age of a person, of course, has, uh, for example, taking, as you know, you know this as well as anybody, as people age, um, their arteries harden. And so, for example, their blood pressure, there's a distinct demographic difference between the blood pressure of young, healthy people and old, older people, regardless of where they're in health. Um, so, of course, this data, we, as is very helpful from, for a machine learning uh, purpose, this data is already naturally collected in the clinical process. However, the accessibility of the data does need to be managed with uh, care and uh, with great ethics. It's actually uh, one of the things that we're going to be bringing on later to the show where um, we have some of the uh, clinicians talking about, well, how we decide what's actually ethical to display and allow uh, you know, machine learning people like ourselves to analyze. But yes, th there is certainly a lot of information. One thing, though, I would just say, plugging very quickly what I do is I think one of the nice advantages of the, about the personalized modeling is that you can actually step away from some of that demographic information. So we're not really, you don't care so much as saying, okay, well, this is a 38 year old woman, or this is a 25 year old man. You don't need to rely on those broad demographic descriptions because they're, you're only modeling their specific vital signs. And I think that's helpful. So you're saying, um, when you're saying, oh, this patient has rapid deterioration. It is with respect to their own health. So I think, I think that it is an interesting thing. Um, but one of the things I'm really hopeful for with uh, personalized medicine is that essentially personalization allows us to step away from some of those broader, I would say more crude descriptions of where a patient ought to be and give it a personalized, uh, a personalized flair. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I love that approach. Cause we're doing, like I said, the same thing with us. We do a lot of patient specific modeling. So this yeah. is right up our alley. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just again, for people uh, who are uh, wondering, uh, when Kristen's talking about, for example, gait analysis, of course, you're going to want to analyze that specific patient's gait. Um, it doesn't do good to, it's no good to be combining or mixing up two patients' gait analyses um, into one analysis. Exactly. Without a hierarchical model of some sort, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so while there, and so I think a lot of uh, these success stories, they sort of boil down to something like this, um, where we have, you know, here are my fancy methods. I have my time series modeling. And then we demonstrate that we're really valuable in our field because we have these success metrics. And so here are my methods, here are my success metrics. My success metrics show definitionally that I'm successful um, and that they, um, here's how I've quantified what I've now added to the field. And I think these things are interesting. Um, they, they, they are necessary to, uh, to try to benchmark how much progress we're making in the field. But at the same time, I think there's a lot to be added by also going through your mistakes. And what I'm gonna be covering today is actually a story of mistakes that I made because I think there's more learning in the mistakes 
um, the, the most learning that you can do is from the mistakes. And especially for these early career data scientists, um, you're gonna be making mistakes before you're gonna be having successes. So you might as well hear about the mistakes. And so I've highlighted four stories, four sort of big mistakes that I made early in my uh, career that were extremely good learning opportunities. And so I thought that'd be good for everyone. If I just laid these bare, everyone could learn with me. So I wasn't the only person who learned from these things. And I think that's helpful. And so I'm calling it the uh, uh, four tales of four face plants. Um, the first story, which we'll cover today, is how a flawed assumption led to a flawed machine learning system. Uh, my second one, which is, I think, also pretty funny, um, where we had an algorithm that was actually mathematically incapable of strong performance. So if you went and looked at the math of the algorithm involved, you could have told, you could have known from the beginning that it was not going to perform well, given what we were asking of it. Uh, the third example is of an algorithm that doesn't align with the data that's being collected. So this was an experimental design flaw. And then a lot of times when we're trying to say we want to develop uh, a machine learning method from the ground up, we have this new patient data. Um, you do need to make sure that those two things are aligned. And it's a very interesting field, I think, to design algorithms to align with experimental design. And then finally, we have one where it's a discussion of how sometimes algorithms don't actually align with the performance metrics against which they're evaluated. So let's just say that you are only interested in just showing off your cool performance metrics. That's going to be the one to listen to because not all algorithms are on an equal playing field given what the actual performance metric is. And I think that it does warrant some consideration that if you know your performance metric and know the uh, data phenomena that generate that performance metric, then you should be tailoring your algorithm to at least have a fighting chance when it comes to that metric. And so I think that's a very interesting area, especially um, in, for example, medical uh, machine learning, where you might be wanting to layer different algorithms on top of each other. And so if you want to say, okay, I have this one algorithm that captures one phenomenon, and I have this another algorithm that captures another one, and they both uh, correspond to the same performance metric, those are the two, the, you're the, one, the ones that capture different phenomena in order to complement each other. So that's the sort of idea that I'm dealing with in tail number four. So the question is, you know, Glenn, what does this actually have to do with the philosophy of data science? You know, what, what, what does this have to do with critical reasoning? And so the idea behind each of these is they are actually linked by uh, critical reasoning where um, uh, they, they're linked by the following elements. First of all, each of these stories involves a machine learning system with multiple complex components. So these aren't the Sam Tarleys of the machine learning world where they only had one task. You know, there's a lot going on here. And there are a lot of things that need to be tuned, accounted for, explained, and understood. Um, and it was only one of those things that had to fall through in order for the uh, whole system to suffer. Secondly, um, these are problems that could have been resolved in advance with greater critical evaluation. Now, I'm not saying that it would have been easy, but with full uh, critical evaluation, these things would have ar been ar arisen as sort of uh, potential uh, tripping points in the project. Now, most importantly, and the reason that we go over this critical evaluation topic to begin with, is that um, the problem, the ultimate problem that arose had to be detected by critical evaluation. You know, it didn't just fall out from uh, some metric or fall out from the data or was known in advance, we really had to go through and critically evaluate each piece of each component to figure out what was wrong and why our system as a whole wasn't working because there's this individual component that wasn't working. And finally, I guess the happy ending of this would be that um, critical reasoning not only resolved the issue, but it helped resolve the issue successfully, by which I mean that it provided the solutions for achieving the endpoint that we wanted. So even though there was a face plant that was involved in it, we ultimately did achieve success in having learned from that. And I think that's something that's really important for early career data scientists to understand that a lot of the times they'll try something, they'll charge in there, um, and they'll just get their butt kicked, frankly. Uh, like they'll just, um, something falls in their face, the machine learning method doesn't work, the metric doesn't work. And the problem is that they say, oh, well, now I need to try something completely different. And I think that's a mistake. What you should be doing instead is critically evaluating what you've learned to make the most of your mistake to see if resolving the mistake, if you can debug the mistake, then you might be able to move forward. And so you, you, get, to save on, you get to save that time that would have been wasted trying to change projects or something like that. But also 
the process of going through and critically resolving your mistake will yield a solution that you're ultimately trying to get to. So I think that's a very important thing for, especially for a lot of early career data scientists to keep in mind that by trying to critically resolve these mistakes, you can get where you're trying to go to faster because the fact is we are a results driven uh, profession. Results are expected of us. And um, I think that this critical reasoning approach is the way to try to get the results the fastest that you can. And so for those of you who are worried that, uh, well, this sounds like a whole lot to cover today, uh, fear not. Today, we're only going to cover tail number one. And then what I'm going to do is save the three other stories for bonus episodes. We'll just sprinkle them out throughout the series. And um, also, I thought it might be fun to do some little code alongs, provide you with the code, provide you with the algorithms. I think that learning is very helpful if you take a depth first search approach. So you can understand things more broadly if you at least understand one thing deeply. And so I thought that providing depth on this one topic would be, help people sort of uh, track and understand some of the critical reasoning that applies to other topics. And of course, for those of you who came in because you really just wanted to see Andrew Gelman, Kathy Enzer and the like, um, they will, of course, they'll be here next week. Don't worry. Um, you're not going to have to listen to me like five times in a row before you get to the good stuff. So for those who are looking forward to the other presentations, they're coming next week anyway. So don't worry about that. So now on to my story, um, how a flawed assumption leads to a flawed machine learning system. So to set the scene, um, this story happened when I was right at the beginning of my doctoral research project. And I just been given a shiny new uh, thesis titles called Bayesian Gaussian Processes for Identifying the Deteriorating Patient. So it sounds cool, has a cool method. It sounds clinically useful. Um, it, it had all the bits that we need in a thesis title. Um, and the idea was something like this. Well, um, we are going to be fitting Gaussian processes like that time series model that you see um, on the left side. We need fitting these, we're gonna be doing cool stuff with them and we're identifying deteriorating patients and it's gonna be great. And so the intuition behind this is something like the following. While a clinician only sees a given snapshot at time, we're gonna be using the time series um, instead and we're gonna be doing time series modeling to add value. Simple enough. And for our very first project, it couldn't have been any simpler. What we're gonna look at is the following. We know that patients currently, when they deteriorate, it's usually detected because the patient exceeds a certain clinical threshold. So here, the patient's vital sign value is too high, but it could also be too low. And the idea is we can take a time series model, we forecast forward, and then we know in advance when they're gonna pass that threshold. Uh, simple enough. And so, the clinical value of what we're doing is the following. Uh, we forecast forward. We identify in advance that the patient is going to cross that threshold, is going to deteriorate. And then we take that difference in time between the time of the forecast and the time of the actual event, and we bag that. That's our clinical value. And so, you know, nothing could be simpler. The only thing we need to do is forecast and know when it's going to happen, and we've generated clinical value. And then, of course, you know, our, uh, our demonstration of uh, value would be something like um, we have uh, early warning time, which we just saw, and we gain that early warning time with the forecast. But also because we have these fancy machine learning methods, we're going to be making fewer prediction mistakes. So we can be, you know, moving noisy, removing noisy data and things like that. So a fewer prediction mistakes, more advanced warning, we're going to be demonstrating value, and everything's going to be great, you know. Uh, it seems so straightforward. People are going to like know my name in the department because I'd solved this problem. Um, you know, it was sky was the limit. Everything was very exciting. And um, now, of course, to make this plan, here, here was sort of my line of reasoning because I think it's very important to write out your line of reasoning. It was something like this. First, I fit the Gaussian process model to the patient's time series. I just get good at that. Um, I learned how to forecast with accuracy. And then once I can forecast with accuracy, well, the only thing I need to do is take that forecast and know when people are going to deteriorate. And then um, when I know they're, they're going to deteriorate, I calculate the difference between when I knew they were going to deteriorate, because now it's, it's me. It's me who is going to know that. Um, and when the patient actually deteriorates. So that was sort of my line of reasoning right there. I, think, I thought it was a nice, solid, deductive line of reasoning. Now, the emotional side of it is something more like this. 
fitting the Gaussian processes is cool. So we'll work on, uh, so I have that. But once I fit the Gaussian processes and I'm good at that, well, the forecasts naturally fall from being able to fit those models. So that's a trivial step once I've done step one. And once I have my forecast, well, knowing whether there's an alarm threshold in the forecast is trivial, is trivial too. And then once I know that there's an alarm, calculating the difference between when I alarmed and when the patient actually deteriorated is trivial as well. So between step one, which is the cool fun step, and the glory at the end where I've now just really contributed to my field, it's I do one thing right and then the rest just is trivially, it, fall, it falls through. Um, and so was my belief system at that time. And furthermore, I thought the, something like this, well, if this fitting the personalized Gaussian processes, because that is a challenging task, um, if that is the most challenging task, and it's also the most fun, well, obviously that's where I should focus. Um, it, it, it all seems so clear. Um, and it is true that I didn't need to focus on that. But, and I, I really did focus on that. Um, there is so much cool machine learning stuff to do in this process. And so I wrote some examples of the various different things that you tune for a machine learning system when you're trying to get good time series forecasts. So for example, the, the selection of the training model and how you deal with your training data, you know, the transformations, uh, downsampling, uh, warping functions, things like that. And then we have the model selection itself, um, you know, test deciding what parameters and what parameterizations and the complexity of the models we're going to use. The priors we're going to use to regularize those and assumption checking. And then of course, there's the inference method. So how we're going to actually fit those parameters given the model that we have selected. So why did you select the Gaussian process? Why were you choosing this model? Yeah, that, that is a very, that is a very important question. I think it is mainly we wanted, uh, one, we think it's important to let the data speak for itself. So we always choose methods that can allow you to properly represent the data generating process. So whatever physiology is generating the data, we thought that the Gaussian process would be amenable to, mo to modeling that type of phenomena. Um, and so, of course, it's not perfect because, you know, the assumptions of Gaussian and things like that um, don't typically apply to vital signs, but the dynamics are something that do. And of course, when we have access to all these other cool things like uh, data transformations and data cleaning, that we thought that um, with those things, compared to the Gaussian process method, uh, the Gaussian process also gives us the flexibility that we would want to be changing out these models. So between the flexibility within the model and the external flexibility of data manipulation, we thought that we had a, a winning pair there. And I, I still think that we do. But yeah, um, that, that is actually, I think, a very good po uh, point that you brought up that when you are doing, uh, selecting models, it is very important to say, well, what is the data saying? And why is the data being generated in that way? And you should be selecting models that um, rep uh, properly represent the data generating process. Thank you. I think that's one thing that really separates experienced uh, data scientists from less experienced because you make sure you get that bit right. Otherwise, you're not going to have a fun time. 100%. 100%. Yeah, that's why random forests are not going to be covered in this presentation. Um, <laughs> so just to give you guys a quick idea about the different uh, ways that, you know, we uh, work with this data, there's things like downsampling where Gaussian processes are actually uh, fairly computationally expensive to fit uh, because you, isn't, you have to invert a covariance matrix. And that inversion process basically it cubes with the size of the data. So making experimental choices like, well, how how much of our data can we downsample? How much can we drop out while still retaining the information in the time series? And can we drop more data that's older and keep some more recent data? Things like that. You can also be downsampling in order to um, achieve certain algorithmic outputs of your own. So for example, if you're looking to have a uh, Cholesky decomposition of your covariance matrix, you can be augmenting the training data in that way to allow you to have that computational efficiency if your model supports it and the data is available uh, to do such a thing. So there's a number of uh, considerations, even for something as simple as downsampling, as simple as just dropping data out or putting data in that can affect your algorithm. There's also transformations like the log transformation or warping data. And so just in a nutshell, as uh, Kristen brought up, 
Gaussian processes, they are Gaussian, um, which means that they have probability density across the entire real line. Whereas in reality, vital signs don't have probability density across the real line. You don't have negative heart rate. You don't have negative breathing rate. And so you might want to do something like a log transformation so that you fit your Gaussian process to the log. And then when you uh, detransform the data, then your actual fitted model is constrained to what is physiologically plausible. So now the uh, prediction won't actually go below uh, zero. Another advantage is that for something like heart rate, which has high dynamic jumps, so you'll have, it's very common for heart rate values to just jump up rapidly. This log transformation essentially, um, I won't say linearizes, but at least helps smooth out that aspect. And now onto the real cool bit, uh, which uh, Kristen also alluded to, uh, thereby stealing my thunder. So uh, basically, um, we now come to the real cool bit, the model selection. And this is where we're trying to do the uh, automated model adaptation. So I know there's a lot of early career data scientists there out there. When I talk about things like the mean uh, function and the covariance function, many of us are familiar, for example, with the uh, Andrew Ng Coursera course on machine learning. And so when we talk about uh, selection of the covariance function, it's very similar, at least in purpose, uh, to selecting the complexity of your models that way and selecting feature complexity. And so what we can see here, for example, is that we have a Gaussian process. While the trend was flat, it had a simple model, then it picked up on uh, that there's an upward trend and added complexity, and then it's finding periodicity and adding further complexity. So that is, uh, from an intuitive perspective, that's, that's what we're looking at here. We're looking at what our complexity of the model is and how to flip out that complexity for each individual patient as we get more data. Now there's other things too, like regularization, learning the priors that an individual patient, uh, learning the priors that will regularize the fit of your model. And finally, since we're already automatically fitting this, these statistical models, we can also automate the assumption checking. Now, of course, there's a certain irony in the fact that I'm talking about automated assumption checking when this entire presentation is about me making a failed assumption. But um, anyway, there is a lot of, the idea is there's a lot of cool work that can be done to make sure that these models are very well uh, curated from the data. And the final bit is inference. Now, I know a, a lot of people, uh, particularly when you're just getting into data science thing, uh, conflate the model with the inference done. But the idea behind the inference, for those who aren't as familiar with the term, is that we have our model now and we're trying to figure out what parameter values to select for that model. So there's many ways you can do it. For example, you can try to optimize your parameters, maximize likelihood or maximize the a posteriori distribution. Alternatively, you can integrate over your posterior distribution. So instead of uh, relegating yourself to a single selection of parameters, you can integrate across a range of parameters to see if that provides a more robust estimate for your uh, end model. And since we're using Bayesian methods on this, um, it's very important to be comparing the performance between these two methods and also the computational trade-off between uh, a less computationally burdened something like optimization versus integration. And now, of course, there's nothing stopping you also from just you know, rolling your own inferential method. Uh, it might be ill-advised, but there are many cases where you might be wanting to tailor your uh, inference method to the uh, data at hand or the actual clinical application or the end use of that. And if you wanna see a really good example of that, uh, Alison Meisner's presentation earlier in the series, um, in the podcast series, describes one of those examples. Cool, and so there it was. We had everything we needed. We went through and we did all these steps. We had this you know, shiny, cool machine learning system that automatically fits the data, it model checks, it adapts the Gaussian process model to the patient's personalized data. And all the better, it does it faster than in real time. So we didn't even really come up against the really big computational burden. So everything was going fine. We had fit, we had met step one, and now the rest was meant to fall out from it. So of course, that's not actually what happened. Um, while we were expecting to look at these performance metrics and see a huge benefit from our new method compared to the uh, older, more heuristic method. What we saw was actually a performance metric that will still haunt me in my dreams to today. Um, the methods, the two performance metrics 
could not have been more similar as if someone had literally taken one and generated the other one by just adding random, a little bit of random noise to it. Um, they were so overlaid of each other in the plot that you could barely, you, it was hard to distinguish them except little bits where they occasionally uh, poked out from one another. Um, and it felt like, it felt like it was like they were braided together. Um, it felt like someone was actually trying to tease me in a way because they didn't even give me the dignity of me being worse than the simplistic method. It was exactly the same. So as if to, as if to quantify, I've contributed exactly nothing to the field compared to what we already had. Um, and so, you know, obviously that, that, that's not good. Uh, it was exactly the same. Uh, and so, um, the question is why, you know, we, we put all this time into getting these Gaussian process models to fit well. We really did. We looked through the data and we had really good forecasting accuracy. We very rarely did we have inaccurate forecast of the time series um, beyond what we thought was acceptable. So the question is why did this method not work to detect patients before they deteriorated? So it went back to the drawing board. You know, we said, okay, if we fit these personalized models well, then the rest should fall out. We can forecast the accuracy. We checked it. Yes, we are very good with our, our accuracy. Um, we went through and checked each bit to make sure that, uh, that it was implemented correctly. And then in this process, what I discovered was the following. When we were looking through, yes, we did a correct general forecasting accuracy. But at the same time, where we didn't have as much forecasting accuracy was where the patients were actually deteriorating. <clears throat> so it looks something like this. In the healthy patient group, we had, and I have my legend down here for, you know, uh, high, very high forecast accuracy with the uh, cool green and blue, and then the poor and really bad uh, forecasting accuracy is in the uh, magentas and the reds. And the idea is for a large number of these healthy patients, um, we just had good forecast inaccuracy. Of course, we would have the occasional uh, inaccurate forecast, but they were fairly rare. Uh, usually some hiccup in the algorithm when you're trying to automate a prediction process, you know, minutely over hours. And when we looked at the deteriorating patients, the patients who did have these adverse clinical outcomes, well, by and large, they actually had pretty good forecasting accuracy too. We were very good at forecasting their accuracy, except at the point where they were deteriorating. So here, as we got closer and closer to the patients deteriorating, that is when our forecasting accuracy fell apart. So as you can see, well, yes, we were correct in saying we were fairly good at forecasting. You, even in some cases, we were very good at forecasting. We weren't good at forecasting at the one point that it really mattered to achieve what we were trying to achieve. And to add insult to injury, our understanding of what that data generative process looked like was also flawed. We were imagining that these patients would have these sort of slow, predictable uh, deteriorations where they would, their heart rate would slowly climb into a, an unstable range or it would slowly descend into um, a worrisome range. But that's actually not what it looked like. When patients were deteriorating, it looked something more like this, where their vital signs would have these shocks, they would have these destabilizations, they would drop or rise. Um, but they wouldn't surpass these sort of critical thresholds. And they'd have a number of these shocks before finally losing homeostasis and having a rapid deterioration. So the idea was even if we had been able to accurately forecast when a patient's deteriorating, the time warning between them having normal looking values in and deteriorating is so rapid that there would have been no time saved. We might as well just wait for the event to occur. So what this really brings about is we had this, you know, deductive logical process um, and we did the first thing well. We were really good at fitting the personalized Gaussian process models. We put a lot of work into that. We were very good at, uh, we did check its accuracy, made sure it worked well on a personalized level, made sure it worked well for a general population. But the issue was that in the instances where we actually needed it, it was precisely where it wasn't working. So essentially we had these things that were innocuous uh, assumptions. They're even uh, assumptions that we had empirically validated, but there was a hole in our logic. And so that's where I think the critical reasoning element comes in where if you're trying to debug these problems, um, that, that's how you need to be looking at these, where you have these things that seem a little bit benign assumptions, 
but they might actually have a major uh, caveat in them. So just very quickly, the upshot to this though was by having spent so much time, invested so much work in the actual machine learning system, we actually now had a machine learning system that reliably highlighted physiology of interest. It was the rapid volatile dyna dynamics. So while it couldn't forecast uh, these uh, deteriorations like we wanted, we were very good at generating extra information that clinicians did want brought to their attention. So rapid drops like these, um, where the patient's heart rate drops rapidly. Those are very good precursor signs to some of the uh, further deteriorating physiology. And so um, our machine learning system did work, but again, as opposed to just throwing the whole system out, what we said was, okay, what have we learned from this? Where is it failing? And where can this machine learning system that we've invested so much in, what can it pick up? So my final few takeaways from this are the following, and I think it's uh, quite helpful. Um, one, when you're developing your machine learning strategies, you know, it's very helpful to explicitly light out, line out your, first of all, when you're developing your machine learning strategy, it's helpful to explicitly write out your line of reasoning, why you think this method is going to work. You say something like this, uh, the data behaves like this, and we are going to capture this element, et cetera. And you work through and you know, even draw out a picture about what you're trying to capture and why it works. Next, as many of us know, these assumptions that seem innocuous can, of course, be false. So, of course, the fact that they seem reasonable is not enough. But I'd add to that, the assumption can also be empirically validated. You know, th this assumption that we could ac accurately forecast, we weren't just guessing that. We weren't just assuming that we had looked through our performance metrics and determined that we had very high accuracy for the vast majority of forecasts. And yet still, even with that being empirically true, that still was also the snag in our, in our machine learning system, the accuracy of the forecasts. And finally, uh, just one bit is, and I know that this isn't the most vogue with a lot of uh, machine learning where the idea is you just try to throw your data in the system and let your machine learning system learn what it needs to learn. And of course, there's a place for that. Um, but I think for a lot of this clinical research, it's very important for you to specify the exact phenomenon that you're wanting to detect with your data. And then you build the algorithm to detect specifically that. And there's several reasons for this. One, you need to have in your own mind what you're trying to get the machine to do. Because if you don't have it in your own mind, how can you expect an algorithm to do that as well? There are cases where the algorithm is much better than that. But for a lot of these complex clinical scenarios, that might not be enough. And if you do know where you're trying to direct your algorithm, then your algorithm is going to have a better chance. It's also just good for general intellectual clarity to know what you're trying to do. And you know, being a bit hand wavy about what you're wanting from your algorithm is probably not a good way to start debugging your problems. Um, so I think that those, those takeaways are generally what I present to a lot of young machine learning researchers and statisticians, um, especially in things like valve time monitoring, where once I got good at this work, a lot of early career statisticians you know, were like coming to me and saying, okay, here's my problem. Here's how I've been doing it. It's not working. Why is it not? And these are some of the, the key aspects that I give them. And I think I really do stand by them. Um, even now when I only do about half my work in biosign monitoring um, and do the rest in like drug supply, um, I still stand by these rules. And I just change the word biosign for drug supply and work along those things to say specifically what am I trying to pick up. So that's about it. And now I guess we will return. So Kristen, uh, how, how was that? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I really enjoyed it. And I think, like you said, it's really important for young researchers, young investigators to understand that there are going to be mistakes. But like you said, you can learn from them. And I really enjoyed what you learned from it, especially I think your last takeaway was really great. Um, just about really tailoring your algorithm to detect a specific event. You know, like you said, you can put in everything in there and it can detect it any kind of thing, but the fact that you were saying, we want to detect this specific event that we know that precedes, you know, these deteriorations was huge. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm almost a little jealous myself because, you know, a lot of our work is ACL injuries and we have yet in our field to ever detect an ACL injury, you know, in real time. And so I think we'd all love to have that kind of uh, event detection, that kind of time point to say, this is what we need to look for. So. I thought that was great. And so with respect to that, how long do you guys get that data for? I think I saw, you know, 34 hours, you know, 48 hours, those kind of things. How long of a data set are you getting per person? Yeah. Um, 
It does vary, although for that data, which was a step downward. So typically, uh, the typical medical drama, you'll see like the ICU, which is the intensive care ward. And um, there's a difference between what an ICU means in different countries, uh, just depending on how they triage patients. But these patients who are seen, um, they could be in there for as little as a few hours, and they could be in there as long as several weeks. Um, so in, I guess the the most the best representative patient of that is, for example, like the ventilated, the mechanically ventilated patient. Of course, now we're hearing a lot more about with uh, COVID-19, where you can have patients who they will be on the ward for weeks and weeks because just by virtue of them being on the ward, uh, their physiology deteriorates and they're less able to breathe for themselves. So yeah, there's a long range. And so when you're trying to develop these machine learning systems, you have to keep in mind that you're probably going to have a system where you have one system for when the patient just comes on board, uh, which might even say, you know what, I'm not even making a decision until they've been here for an hour or two and I know more what's going on. And we then will also have the patients who, you know, have been there for several weeks in a row. And, you know, that's a massive amount of data. Um, and of course, it's being con collected secondly at the same time. So, um, yeah, there, there's, there's a huge dynamic range. And I think that important thing that you're bringing up is that, um, how long the patient has been on ward is also a uh, is also a clinical marker in its own right. So um, yeah, there, there definitely is a multifactorial aspect to that. Yeah, and so I was even wondering with that respects is you know I know your initial model didn't predict what you thought it was going to predict, but could you then kind of use that maybe as a, a rehabilitation? So like I said, our work is a lot of first injury prediction, but then rehabilitation. Could you maybe use that model to see when people should even get cleared from the hospital? Um, well, well, of course, you know, like I try to avoid making the, the, those statements until it's like a very specific uh, clinical scenario. But I would say um, the, there are several things here. And actually, it's, uh, there's an interesting element. So uh, part of the idea is that we should be, if, once we, one, most importantly, we want to detect whether or not the patient is soon to deteriorate. Um, but yes, we are looking for information that this patient is also um you know, on, on the mend. And I think one interesting aspect is that um, a lot of the times when people say, oh, we're going to add more data. So for example, this patient who's now been on the week, we can add more data to them. Um, and then the idea is, well, with more data, we can make these models more complex. But an interesting thing is sometimes when you have more data, you can actually make the model simpler because if they're getting healthier, for example, then there might be fewer dynamics in the model that you have to actually, or there might be fewer dynamics in the data that you actually have to model. So there is an actual interesting element here that I think is very important where if we go from just using the model to quantify where the patient is to essentially trying to have a, um, like a grammar over models. And so we, we have a vocabulary of what our different models are and we use those models to describe where the patient is. And I think that is an important aspect. Um, and I've, I've fiddled around with that, but it is a severely incomplete uh, piece right now. Okay. Um, and no, I was also wondering, like you said, if your goal was to detect deterioration, especially earlier, how early in advance were you starting to see those shocks on average? Yeah. So that's a very important thing, especially because um, when we're talking about the metrics that we use, because part of the question is, you know, what is an alarm versus what's a false alarm? If you know the patient deteriorates at midnight, is an alarm at 8 p.m., uh, an accurate alarm or is it a false alarm? Um, obviously, if you're going to say you can go extreme, was an alarm two years in advance an accurate alarm or a false alarm? Um, and so that, that is one of sort of the sort of machine learning experimental design decisions you're going to have to make, how far you can go out. Um, for a lot of my work, uh, for, well, specifically for this one, I happen to know uh, we use this eight-hour window. And so we essentially assume that any alarms on deteriorating patients within that eight-hour window were very plausibly in relation to um, the imminent deterioration. And I would say that another aspect is that once a patient has deteriorated once, that also changes how we deal with them. So say that a patient has now um, had a heart rate that dropped below 30 or you know hit 180 or something like that. The clinician, that data now is no longer just like, oh, this data is not, this data has now been clinically interfered with. There's gonna be some doctor who's now gonna be um, hovering over them and, you know, providing some type of uh, clinical intervention. So uh, it is important to keep in mind that these aren't just casually observed patients. They are, the people are actively intervening in their time series as we try to model it. 
Oh yeah, that is a wonderful point that I, I didn't think of because like I said, in our work, no one's really intervening <laughs> too often in that kind of real time situation. So that, that does add an, another caveat, um, different level of complexity to it. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, like, and again, as you point out, you know, like not having detected an ACL, uh, like, is, I guess, injury or tear in real time, you know, first of all, because, well, like this system, it might happen instantaneously, um, where there is, there might be no precursors, or the precursors might be extremely subtle. And when you add that to the fact that obviously no one wants to be the positive control on that type of study, you know, there isn't very much, um, you might not have very much data to go on. So, um, and that's, I think, one of the important things that um, when, when you're dealing with like our medical fields where the events of interest are fairly rare compared to the rest of the data, you do have to be judicious by how you're analyzing it. Yeah. And, and like you said, bringing it all back again to your performance metrics. And I, I liked what you're talking about. It was like, you know, we really designed it to capture these changing dynamics. Um, because like you said, you know, we have a lot of things in our work where, you know, you have physiological models and, and things of that nature, but a lot of our work like you're doing is picking up the changes dynamics that we think are really precursors to this. So, you know, in, in your field, I was wondering, you know, with respect to, you know, did you start with your model of identifying these critical thresholds that were kind of already out in the literature? And then through your work, have you kind of gone in and said, hey guys, we need to, we need to change these or we need to kind of think about these a little differently? Yeah, actually, yeah, you've uh, you've described that exactly how we did it. So the idea is that um, the heuristic thresholds are out there in the literature. Uh, doctors know pretty well what the overall patient population should look like, and they design the thresholds around that. So that's where you see things like the National Early Warning Score, uh, the um, there's the Pediatric Warning, warning Score. There's uh, things like that, and these are essentially threshold methods where you see what box you fit people into. And so when we take that and then we say, okay, well, these are, by the time that they are warning for these, they are really bad. How can we go far? How can we go ahead of that? Um, so we took those, we validated whether or not those are real deteriorations from those thresholds. And then we started developing our systems around those. Um, I think you, you had, you had another bit that I wanted to hit, but I've <laughs> forgotten it. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, the dynamic, you, there's something that you said about the dynamic element. Another thing that's important is that, um, uh, and this is something that I was going to bring up in a, in a later discussion, but patients not only have different dynamics, but they occupy very different ranges. So the actual magnitude of their values is very different. Um, so there's actually very, uh, again, that's a clinical reasoning issue that um, if you're only going to be alarming on high or low values, you're actually going to be missing out on a large number of patients who have average values, who just you know have persistent stubborn average values. Um, and you're only be picking up on patients who they are not only deteriorating, but also they're deteriorating and have high average personal values. So I think there, there's another important element there that, that I would definitely like to discuss in another, um, and in the, the, the one about tailoring your, uh, your machine learning algorithm to the metric that, um, that that's, that's where, um, you can essentially, well, yeah, you can, you can just see that there, the, these patients, their values actually say whether or not you should be trying to do it on magnitude versus the actual dynamics. No, and that's why I've, I've picked up on it. Cause like you said, in our work, we, you know, I get a little frustrated with the literature. I guess I shouldn't say this <laughs> and, and public, but I, I think a lot of is placed on the magnitude of it. And what we've seen a lot in our work is this, the changing dynamics are really um, what's hitting home and what, what we think are pr the predictors of all these. So no, I, I was glad to hear you say that. I'm, I'm going to, you know, show this to the friends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it definitely is a challenge because, of course, in order to pick up dynamics, you need things like um, you need continuity of your data observations. You need them to be dense enough that you can actually identify what a dynamic is and when it's changed. Um, so when you are trying to do things, you're trying to shift from uh, classifying on magnitudes versus classifying on dynamics. Um, you are really requiring a different type of um, data collection system there. Um, you might be lucky like me and get to have it because you already have continuous vital sign monitoring. But if you're in a sparser scenario, like uh, nurse nursing observations, or you just come in once an hour or every few hours, obviously the dynamic system doesn't work there because you don't have all that extra data. And similarly, uh, like in uh, social sports medicine cases, you know, you aren't going to be cont continuously monitoring the strain on every tendon. Um, that, that, that doesn't work. Um, so it is something where you, yeah, the, there are some methods that are really cool, but you might be really challenged to actually be able to acquire the data required to quantify that. 
Oh, hundred percent. And if you know somebody who can measure the strain, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're out there. Maybe they're listening right now. Contact me. Um, but yeah, and I think that you lead to the, I think the million dollar question that everyone is doing now in research and, and, and finishing up is remote monitoring. You know, how well, how easily can this be integrated to somebody at home? Um, seeing how no one can kind of go into the hospitals anyway, we have limited access. <laughs> how, you know, is this feasible? Yeah, it, it absolutely is feasible. And I, I, you know, one of the lucky things in my career is I got to work at uh, one of the companies that is really doing one of the like world leading jobs in uh, remote monitoring and home monitoring. And I think they're, what really stuck out to me is that, you know, it's more than just a data problem. Um, and it's more than just a device problem that there's this, um, there's an ecosystem around those that are supporting it. It's not just biomedical engineers. It's just plain old engineers uh, doing these things like just, uh, addressing every single aspect to develop the system, make it reliable, make people want to use it. And I think that this continuous monitoring, whether it's at home, whether it's uh, mobile continuous monitoring, like you might get from wearables, it is really exciting for several reasons. One, again, back to what we said, the continuity of the data, but just by having more of that data there, I think people make a mistake and say, oh, we just need more data. It's not about just having more data. It's having more of the salient data when you need it, whether or not it's accurate. We don't need more messy data. Um, you know, We don't need more data at the points where it's not interesting, um, but we do need more data at certain points. And I think that my quick, you know, like off the cuff prediction is that when we have more of these wearables, one of the best things is I think that we are on the way to a new revolution of our understanding of human physiology, because it's gonna be uncovering dynamics that we hadn't previously thought of. And one of the, I think, really interesting things is when you talk to the people who are uh, really ingrained in some of these cutting edge wearables, they are noticing physiology that has not been talked about very much in the literature, if at all. F physiology that has not actually been well described. And I think that this is something similar to like finding cryptids in nature where you're essentially, you're going to have, there are some Bigfoots and Loch Ness monsters of physiology out there that are actually going to be discovered because of the wearables. And I think that besides the cool machine learning bit, there's going to be a very, very respectable scientific discipline that is going to be advanced because of this data that's available. And I think that's probably the most exciting thing about wearables that I can think of. No, I'm a hundred percent with you. So I agree. It's an exciting uh, world we're getting into. So, and like you said, you taking the approaches that you laid out today is going to make us, I think it'll help us get us there faster. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess maybe, that, maybe that's a good uh, point to end with where I know that, the way that I do my research, sometimes it does seem like it's sort of overly methodical and it's just plodding along. Um, and I know that, um, you know, when you're earlier in career and you want to make your name for yourself, and you just want to get that for success. It seems like, you know, I'm, I don't want to be like Mr. Miyagi, like making you like wax cars and everything, but by taking this methodical approach, it does make sure that you will get somewhere at the end. And I think that's much more important than just sort of flying everywhere, trying a bunch of things and not making very much progress where if you do take these types of approaches, even if you fail on some level, you'll at least have the path to succeed further on. And people will understand why it didn't succeed. And I think that's an, as important of information as whether or not you did succeed. And I know that's easy for someone to say when they've had success in machine learning. It's like, oh, it's the process, things like that. But it really is it's, it's your insurance plan. So if your machine learning method doesn't work, critical reasoning is your insurance plan to make sure that you still have a future and you can still keep working forward that way. And I do think that by going through and uh, being methodical and really critically valuing this is the way forward um, to distinguish yourself. And also it just makes good conversation like the ones we've had today. Uh, I agree. Yeah, so summarize, just trust the process. Right? Trust, trust the process, attention to detail, uh, think critically. Yeah. Um, don't rush things. Um, and things like that, unless, and, and unless you got deadlines, uh, and then which case just, just, uh, just don't sleep. You don't rush it. You just, you just stop sleeping. Um, so that you can, you know, work those extra hours and deliver. Um, but yeah, cool. Well, Kristen, thanks so much for your time today. Um, obviously really looking forward to, uh, hearing from your group in I guess maybe a few weeks or, a month or a few weeks, something like that. But yeah, something like that. Yeah, but thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been great. Cool. Well, I'll give you the final word and let you say goodbye to our audience. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>
Hey guys, it's Glenn. Thanks so much for listening to this most recent episode of the Philosophy of Data Science. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and hitting that subscribe and bell button, or a small channel and every bit helps. If you have a lab, a department, some students or some colleagues who you think would enjoy this episode, please consider sending along. Again, every bit helps, and we really appreciate your word of mouth. Our next episode on the Philosophy of Data Science will be coming out 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday of next week, so we look forward to seeing you then. But if you can't wait to get more data science, machine learning, and statistical content, feel free to look around the rest of the channel. We have a large number of playlists, including things like machine learning for healthcare, uh, ethics and AI, and things like that. So give a look around. There's plenty more content for you to enjoy. You can also check out our website to not only see past episodes, but what's coming up and see who our sponsors are. Thank you to our sponsors for your support. Now, while the views discussed on the show typically range between extraordinary and mind-blowing, the stated views don't necessarily represent those of the host, our sponsors, my employer, your employer, the speaker's employer, or anyone else not saying those words. And as always, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. See you next week.